Well, I'm looking forward to this study of the Psalms with you on Wednesday nights for the next several weeks. The Psalms provide such tremendous uh, instruction to us on how to have an encounter with the true and living God. It is Israel's book of worship. It was compiled and put together after the exile, and it contains the great long history of Israel's worship relationship with the Lord. The life of every believer ought to be absolutely filled with the Psalms. Jesus' life was filled with Psalms, and so we need to be people who are daily encountering God uh, through these expressions of worship. Now, we're not going to go through all 150 Psalms. That would take us a really long time, but I do want to give you a shape and a sense of the plot line of uh, this book of encounter, and that's the word you're going to be uh, hearing is encounter. The Psalms give us so much instruction about how we can have a vital, vibrant, personal relationship with a God who hears us and speaks to us and wants us to hear and speak to Him. Before we dive into this study and get basically an introduction uh, tonight, I do want to make you aware of some things that are going on in the life of our church. First of all, let me say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your faithfulness in worship. Thousands of people have been watching each week at our online services. That has really exceeded our expectations. It certainly exceeded mine. And we're so thankful that so many are joining and being a part of that. And my prayer for you is that you're being encouraged week by week as we gather online. We've also been very encouraged by your faithfulness in giving. God's provision through His people has been just overwhelming and encouraging. Thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, as you've been faithful, uh, those resources are, are making much of Jesus here in Fairhope and, and all around the world, and, and I'm thankful for that. And that has opened an opportunity uh, for us to serve. Uh, many of you have been giving to our coronavirus relief fund. And so uh, this coming Monday, May the 4th from 9 uh, to noon, we're going to do a food distribution through our First Hope ministry. So if uh, you're needing help or you know someone who needs some help, if you'll call the church office or you'll have them call, we'll put their name on a list. Uh, and then uh, next Monday, we'll have a food uh, that we'll make available to them. We'll have a whole system set up. So we observe all the social distancing rules. But uh, we do uh, want to minister to people who've been hurt uh, by this virus, maybe through a job loss or uh, through different uh, challenges like that. And so uh, please let us know if there's a need. And uh, we, we would love to be the hands and feet of Jesus uh, to people who are in need of that. Hope you'll be a part of that opportunity. Well, let's look together at the Psalms. As I've already said, the, the, the central focus that we're going to be looking at together is that of encounter. And the book of Psalms defines and sums up our encounter with the one true living God. It points the way so that our faith isn't a derivative faith. It isn't based on what someone else is experiencing, but it's a, a true encounter that we have one-on-one -on -one with God. Because that's really what we have in these psalms. There are songs, there are hymns that are expressions of, of individual Israelites' encounter uh, with God. And so they point the way on how we can have the same kind of vital engagement with God. We don't want a secondary experience that just lays hold of, of some benefits of being a Christian, but doesn't really walk into the fullness of relationship. Uh, don't know if you know the name Rosie Ruiz. Uh, Rosie was the uh, winner, uh, at least for a little while, of the Boston Marathon in 1980. She set records. Uh, she uh, came across the finish line 25 minutes faster than any previous race she had been in. But after some investigation, it was discovered that the reason uh, Rosie seemed to come out of nowhere and win the race is because she did come out of nowhere and win the race. About a half a mile from the finish line, she just sort of stepped out of the crowd and ran and won. But she couldn't really tell anything about the race. She couldn't describe the course or talk about any of the process uh, that she had been through. And so after just a few days, they realized she uh, was cheating and made it all up. And they took the um, they, they took the award away from her. And we sort of hear a story like that and shake our heads, but all too often that's a good expression of our uh, life of faith. Uh, we want the benefits, we want the rewards, we want the accolades, but we don't want to really walk through uh, the experience. We don't really want to have the depth of encounter 
that opens up the doorway uh, to uh, that kind of, of um, spiritual growth uh, that we're looking for. And so the Psalms push us to have a deep encounter with a God who wants to speak. And this encounter is really centered on, a, on, on really a fundamental expression of God to us and us to God. Now here's what I want you to catch. It's a lot of Psalms, 150. There's a lot of detail, but it really comes down to a fundamental call of God to us and a fundament, fundamental reply of us back to Him. God says to us in the Psalms very simply, trust me and obey me. It's just like that old hymn, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's what God says to us in the psalm. Trust me and obey me. And our response back to God is to, to say, God, I need you. And God, I trust you. You're going to find that being the refrain of the response of the worshiper. A deep need for God. A recognition that things aren't what they should be. A deep need for God's rescuing and restoration and presence. But also a deep expression that He really is all we need. He really is the only thing that can satisfy us. And so it's not a complicated relationship that we have with God. He wants us to trust Him and obey Him. And He wants us to cry out to Him and to simply entrust ourselves to Him. And the Psalms really lay that out. At the center of this encounter in the Psalms is the Torah, is the law. This is just this expression of, of faithful obedience, of trusting obedience. Uh, you know Psalm 19 and Psalm 119. At critical junctures all throughout the Psalms, there is this celebration of God's expression of covenant. That's all the Torah is. That's all the law is, God's expression of covenant, showing us how it is that we can live in covenant relationship with Him. It's a pictures for us of what we need from Him uh, and what He supplied for us in calling us to. And it also points the way to the Messiah. You know that all throughout the Psalms there are strong um, uh, messianic psalms because we know that ultimately the, the one who fully obeys the law, the one who fully keeps the covenant, is this Davidic king who will come, who will be truly faithful, and will open up a way of that kind of faithfulness and obedience encounter for the rest of us. As we are in Christ, uh, and He is the one who fulfills the law, then we have a relationship uh, with God uh, that the Messiah had with God. So this is pictured in the way that the Psalms begin. Psalm 1. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can open it. Uh, the very first verse, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Uh, it's a picture of covenant faithfulness through de delighting in the law. That's Psalm 1. And then Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm. Uh, very clear. It's quoted often in the New Testament as it points ahead to uh, the promise of, of a coming king, a coming Messiah, one who will uh, fulfill and complete the covenant uh, that, uh, that we can't uh, commit to and complete because of our sinfulness. And so uh, this uh, uh, summary of Psalms, first of all, it defines the encounter uh, uh, this encounter is uh, folded around the Torah, a picture of what true covenant faithfulness is all about. The third thing that the Psalms do is they rehearse salvation history. And so you're going to see the, the way the Psalms are organized. It will walk back through uh, Israel's history, salvation history, over and over and over again. This history maps onto Israel. It will map onto the life of David. David uh, writes... Um, uh, half of the Psalms. And so in many ways, David is this thematic, emblematic, paradigmatic character. He is the, he's the faithful Israelite. He's the, the one who pictures true, authentic encounter. He's also the one who fails miserably and needs to be rescued and restored. And then hope for Israel through his family line is a, is a picture of the promises that are still to come. And so uh, David's history and Israel's history is the Messiah's history, and then that becomes our history uh, through faith. And so the Psalms will go over and over and over again through that uh, great uh, 
expression of Israel's salvation history of creation, fall, redemption, and return or consummation. That's a, uh, that's a, um, a constant process, and actually that maps onto our lives as well. Each day we wake up in new mercy every morning. We wake up in, in, in covenant. Uh, we start the day saying to the Lord, Lord, we want to we wanna completely uh, identify with who you are. We want to completely identify with Jesus, and we, we're new creations as we start the day. But then we're going to blow it. We're going to make mistakes and step out of line. Uh, we're going to fail and we're going to fall. And then we're going to be in need of restoration and, and forgiveness, of correction that points us again to a, a fresh new creation um, and new opportunities because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the history of Israel and the history of David and the history of the Messiah uh, becomes a, a picture of the plot of each and every one of our days. Again, as people who are saying, God, I trust you and God, I need you. And so uh, it gives us uh, a picture of the great theological themes as well, a great picture of who God is. Uh, we're going to meet Him as creator, sustainer, protector, as the, uh, the one who uh, uh, judges, the one who makes covenant, the one who uh, provides sacrifice, and the one who restores. So we're going to get a big idea of who God is. We're going to get a big idea of God's plans for redeeming us. And we get a proper idea of ourselves. Psalm 8 tells us that we're made a little lower than the angels, that God has big plans for us as well, that this great big God who says, trust me and obey me, is a God who wants to uh, do great things through us for the world as we say to him, I do trust you and I do need you. And so this book of Psalms falls in the large context of the Old Testament. You know that uh, I always want you to understand uh, context. The better we understand the context of Scripture, then the better we understand that Scripture itself. And so the book of Psalms is the first book in a portion of the Old Testament called the Ketubim. There's your Hebrew word for the day, and it just means writings. It's the portion of the Psalms that really lays out how the covenant life is to be lived. And so part of the structure of the writings uh, is based on the festivals, uh, and then part of the structure of the writings is based on wisdom. And Psalms sits right at the beginning of of the, the writings, and it, it really lays out the full scope of all of the wisdom and all of the celebration uh, that ought to be on display in the life of every uh, believer. And so there's the law, then the prophets, and then the writings. And so uh, those first five books of the Old Testament are the law, and that's really almost like the Gospels of the Old Testament. The first five books of the Bible, uh, 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 Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, is like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, in the New Testament. It really lays out the fundamental picture of what God was up to it is in Israel and how Israel was going to bless the whole world. There's a theologian I really like named William Dumbrell, and he lays out the gospel of the Old Testament. I wanted to read it to you real quick because I think it's so good and I can't replicate it. Uh, again, this is William Dumbrell. Here's what's going on in the Old Testament. God who created the world with a new creation and ultimate view to be achieved ideally by human cooperation had given Israel a model in the Eden narrative of what the world was to be. Dominion in terms of service to God's creation needed to be exercised over the whole world outside the garden. Within this dominion, the model of Genesis 2 was extended over all creation. The failure of humanity to rise to the task in Genesis 3 meant the call of Israel as the world's evangelist. Don't you like that? Israel becomes the world's evangelist. They're going to share God's new creation plans with the whole world. Israel would be the nation calling the world to the new model of God's government, that picture of Eden now offered to the whole world. This was to happen as Israel endorsed uh, kingdom of God values in her promised land, the new Eden. Now, the first five books of the Bible uh, then speak of that process. 
and, uh, and then the next section, the law, then the prophets, they sort of tell the details of that history. The formal prophets, that's just the books we think of as history. They tell of, tell of Israel. Again, that cycle, Israel uh, called, and then they mess up, and then uh, they're punished, and then they cry out, and then God sends a redeemer, uh, and then they're restored, and then unfortunately the process starts over again. And that winds through the, the latter prophets until the people are exiled from the land. And, uh, that's the former prophets. Then the latter prophets, that's Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, uh, and the minor prophets. They tell the story from the, from the prophetic view. If Israel doesn't hear from the Lord, who says, trust and obey me, with the, with the faithful response of, I need you and I trust you, then they miss out on the covenant blessing and, and uh, they... Uh, they'll fail to go in. But if they'll say, yes, God will, will find a way to always keep his promises, even in the midst of Israel's failure. And so that's the law, and that's the prophet. And then the writings really tell the story of how those covenant promises are to be lived day to day. That's why Psalms is so important each day, uh, because it tells us how to live this out in our own lives. And so... Uh, with this picture of the big idea of the book of Psalms, I want you to take a look at a, uh, at a short uh, video by the Bible Project, uh, just a little eight-minute video. These are so good, not only the one for Psalms, but if you're just wanting to do some good Bible study, they walk through uh, every book of the Old and New Testament uh, and even have a lot of other resources as well. I, well, I highly recommend the Bible Project to you, but take a look. Uh, at this video, it will give you a good uh, organizational structure to the book of Psalms. The Book of Psalms, it's a collection of 150 ancient Hebrew poems, songs, and prayers that come from all different periods in Israel's history. Many of these poems are connected with King David, 73 actually, and he was known as a poet and a harp player. But there are many different authors behind these poems. There's the poems of Asaph, or from the sons of Korah, and some are from other worship leaders in the temple. Even Solomon and Moses have their own poems, and nearly one-third of these are anonymous. Now, many of these poems came to be used by the choirs that sang in Israel's temple, but the Book of Psalms is actually not a hymn book. At some point in the period after Israel's exile to Babylon, these ancient poems were gathered together and intentionally arranged into the book of Psalms before us. And it has a very unique design and message that you're not going to notice unless you read it from beginning to end. Now to see how the book of Psalms is designed, it's actually most helpful to start at the end. The book concludes with five poems of praise to the God of Israel, and each one begins and ends with the word hallelujah, which is Hebrew for a command to tell a group of people to praise Yah, which is short for the divine name Yahweh. Now, that's a really nice five-part arrangement, and it looks like someone's giving us a conclusion here to the book. So it invites the question, does the book have any other signs of intentional design? If you pay attention to the headings of the poems, you'll notice that at five places, your Bible translators have the heading book one, book two, book three, four, and five at various points, and that these divide the book into five large sections. Now, the reason for this is that the final poem in each of those sections have a very similar ending that looks like an editorial edition. It reads something like, May the Lord, the God of Israel, be blessed forever and ever. Amen and amen. So the book has a conclusion. It has an internal organization into five main parts. And so the natural place to go from here is now the beginning to look for an introduction. And what do we find? Psalms 1 and 2. Two, which stand outside of book one because most of the poems in book one are linked to David except Psalms one and two, which are anonymous. Psalm one celebrates how blessed the person is who meditates on the Torah, prayerfully reading it day and night and then obeying it. Now the word Torah simply means teaching and more specifically it came to refer to the five books of Moses that begin the Old Testament. And here actually the word seems to be used with both meanings in mind. 
which explains why it has five main parts. The book of Psalms is being offered as a new Torah that will teach God's people the lifelong practice of prayer as they strive to obey God's commands given in the first Torah. Psalm 2 is a poetic reflection on God's promise to King David from 2 Samuel chapter 7, that one day a messianic king would come and establish God's kingdom over the world, defeat evil and rebellion among the nations. Now Psalm 2 concludes by saying that all of those who take refuge in the messianic king will be blessed, precisely the word used to open Psalm 1. And so together, these two poems tell us that the book of Psalms is designed to be the prayer book of God's people as they strive to be faithful to the commands of the Torah as they hope and wait for the future messianic kingdom. Now with these two themes introduced, we can start to see how the smaller books have been designed as well around these two ideas. So for example, book one has right at the center a collection of poems, Psalms 15 through 24, that opens and closes with a call to covenant faithfulness. And then, Psalm 16 to 18, we find a depiction of David as a model of this kind of faithfulness. So he calls out to God to deliver him, and God elevates him as king. Now, in the corresponding set of poems, Psalms 20 to 23, the David of the past has become an image of the messianic king of the future, who will also call out to God. He will be delivered and then given a kingdom over the nations. And then right at the center of this collection is a poem, Psalm 19, dedicated to praising God for the Torah. So here we go. The two themes from Psalms 1 and 2 are bound together tightly here. Book two opens with two poems that are united in their hope for a future return to the temple in Zion. And this is an image closely associated with the hope of the messianic kingdom. Then book two closes with a poem that depicts the future reign of the messianic king over all of the nation. This poem's really amazing because it echoes all these other passages from the prophets about the messianic kingdom. And it concludes by saying that this king's reign will bring about the fulfillment of God's ancient promise to Abraham to bring God's blessing to all of the nations. Book three also concludes with a poem reflecting on God's promise to David, but this time in light of Israel's exile. So the poet remembers how God said he would never abandon the line of David, but now he's looking at Israel's rebellion and its result in destruction and exile and the downfall of the line of David. And so the poet ends by asking God to never forget his promise to David. Book four is designed to respond to this crisis of exile. So the opening poem returns us back to Israel's root with a prayer of Moses. And he does what he did on Mount Sinai after the golden calf incident, which is to call upon God to show mercy. The center of book four is dominated by a group of poems that announce that the Lord, the God of Israel, reigns as the true king of the world, and that all creation, trees, mountains, rivers, are all summoned to celebrate that future day when God will bring his justice and kingdom over all the world. Book five opens with a series of poems that affirm that God hears the cries of his people and will one day send the future king to defeat evil and bring God's kingdom. This book also contains two larger collections, one called the Hollow and the other called the Songs of Ascents. Each one of these collections concludes with a poem about the future messianic kingdom. And these two collections together, they sustain the hope for a future Exodus-like act of God to redeem his people. And then, right between them is Psalm 119. It's the longest poem in the book. It's an alphabet poem. Each line begins with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it explores the wonder and the gift of the Torah as God's word to his people. So here we go. The themes from Psalm 1 and 2, Torah and Messiah, combine all together here in book 5, which brings us all the way back to that five-poem conclusion. In the center poem, Psalm 148, all creation is summoned to praise the God of Israel because he has, quote, raised up a horn for his people. Now the horn here, it's a metaphor of a bull's horn raised in victory. And this image echoes back to the same image used in Hannah's song for Samuel chapter two, but also to the earlier Psalm 132. The horn is a symbol for the future messianic king and his victory over evil. It's a fitting conclusion to this amazing book.
Now, here's one more thing that you are likely going to miss if you don't read this book in order. There's lots of different kinds of poems in the book of Psalms, but they all basically fall into two big categories, either poems of lament or poems of praise. Poems of lament express pain, confusion, and anger about how horrible the world is and how horrible the things are happening to the poet. And so these poems draw attention to what's wrong in the world, and they ask God to do something about it. There's a lot of these in the book, which tells us something important, that lament is an appropriate response to the evil that we see in our world. But what you'll notice is that lament poems predominate earlier in the book, in books one through three. But pay attention, because you'll see praise poems occasionally too. Praise poems are poems of joy and celebration, and they draw attention to what's good in the world, and they retell stories of what God has done in our lives and thank God for it. In books four and five, you'll notice that praise poems come to outnumber lament poems, and it all culminates in that five-part hallelujah conclusion. So this shift from lament to praise, this is profound, and it tells us something about the nature of prayer. As we hope for the messianic kingdom, as the book teaches us to do, this will create tension for us as we look out on the tragic state of our world and of our lives. And so the Psalms teach us not to ignore the pain of our lives, but at the same time, biblical faith is forward-looking, looking to the promise of God future messianic kingdom. And so Torah and Messiah, lament and praise, faith and hope. That's what the book of Psalms is all about. And so as you've just seen, the book of Psalms is uh, structured and divided into five sections. And what I'm going to do in these coming weeks is really sample Psalms out of each one of these sections, uh, and uh, that will uh, be a part of how we learn how the Psalms tells the whole redemptive story of God for us. And so I want to give you a little overview of each of those sections as we prepare uh, to close. Uh, book 1 of the Psalms, um, chapters 3 through 41, we get an introduction to the Psalms in chapters 1 and 2, a picture of covenant faithfulness through Torah and then the faithfulness of the Messiah in Psalm chapter 2 and how the coming together of those two things points us to the truths of Jesus Christ. And so we're introduced in Psalm 1 and 2, and then in book 1, which is chapters 3 through 41, we meet the God who instructs, elects, and delivers. The, the theme of this first section is really God's covenant initiation. You see this in the history uh, of, of David. David once again uh, typifies the, the, the true Israelite, all but four of the Psalms in, in book one were written by David. And so it's a picture of how uh, God um, chooses and, and instructs uh, and preserves David um, uh, throughout uh, his life. Uh, ver, uh, Psalms 16 through 18, David really is a model of covenant faithfulness. And even in book one, you'll see a lot of... of um, of lament psalms where, where, where David is crying out. I mean, you remember early in David's life after God had called him, uh, there was a, a, a period where God was getting him ready to be king through a lot of difficult, uh, trying challenges, really shaping him into a man of faith. But, but David was, um, was obedient during that ta task uh, as he waited on the Lord uh, to uh, accomplish it. Uh, all the things that he wanted to accomplish in David's life. And so in book one, we meet a God who instructs, elects, and delivers. In book two, we meet the God who establishes and maintains. Uh, part of the plot line of, of chapters 42 through 72 is really a movement from David to Solomon. In fact, Solomon writes uh, and is a part of the production of the, of the final psalm in this section. And so in salvation history from God's um, creation of Israel, God's uh, a, a initial saving work uh, to the process uh, by which God establishes his people in the land, he establishes David's uh, rule and his reign. Uh, that's a part of book two in chapters 42 through 43. And 43 uh, uh, there's a, a hope for a, a future a return to the temple in Zion. Solomon is the one who uh, builds the temple, and so there's hope uh, for this temple uh, out in the future. Uh, and then, as I said, it closes in, in um, 
uh, chapter 72 uh, with a desire for this messianic king, a fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. And so you see this uh, pulling together of the whole history of Israel and a promise that that history of Israel is going to be applied to all nations. Book 3, 73 through 89, is the God who rebukes and rejects. And so you, you sort of see this turn in the uh, uh, creation fall uh, that there's always this moment in the, uh, in the history of God's people where they walk away from what they ought to be doing. And so only one psalm, Psalm 89, uh, is, uh, has to do with David. And so uh, the covenant with David is really absent in, uh, in this section of the book of Psalms, and it really uh, points to sin and failure. Psalm 78 speaks of the history of faithlessness, uh, even though God is very faithful uh, throughout uh, the years. And it concludes with Psalm 89, uh, God's promise to David in light of fall and exile. And so uh, uh, if you're really needing to celebrate God's graciousness in the midst of you um, struggling spiritually, the book three of Psalms is really for you. And then book four, uh, Psalm uh, 90 through 106 is the God who remembers and sustains. And so you see this picture uh, after David sins and after David loses the kingdom, uh, this process of God bringing him back into fellowship with himself. Um, uh, uh, Psalm 90 begins actually with a prayer that goes all the way back to Moses, but it's a prayer uh, calling for a return uh, to the beginning, a return to the way things uh, used to be. And so uh, this, this idea of a God who doesn't leave us in our sin, but He rescues us. And then finally, book 5, uh, the God who restores and renews. That's from Psalm 107 uh, to 150. Uh, Psalm 107 to 110, God hears the cries of His people. And, and, and God is going to hear and respond and send a king and defeat evil. Psalms 113 to 118 is called the Hallel in Jewish life. It's likely the psalms that Jesus would have been singing after the Last Supper. It says he left singing a hymn, uh, and the hymn that was sung at Passover were, were Psalms 113 to 118, uh, just, a, just songs of praise uh, to who God is, a celebration of God's uh, faithfulness and, and His mercy throughout the generations. Psalm 120 to Psalm 136 are the songs of ascent. And these are, this picture is the people who've returned to Israel. They're returning uh, to the place of worship and they're rejoicing uh, at the opportunity to, uh, to worship in the temple. And there's a profound sense of hope. And then as you learned in the video, there are um, five uh, psalms that conclude the book of Psalms, uh, and each one of them um, shouts the refrain, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And that's the, it really is, a, uh, is the, the essence of the whole book of Psalms, is, is a cry that says, God, the covenant God, is to be praised. And He is the one who is going to be faithful to us and to bring us back to Himself as a God of grace uh, and as a God of mercy to us. And so uh, I want this story of worship and encounter to be my story. And this story is told over and over and over again in the Psalms. And so we're going to get a sense together of, of these uh, realities in the life of covenant people so they can be a part of our life together as well. If you were watching worship this past Sunday, you, uh, you got to see Eliana Steiniger sing a song that she wrote I don't know if you knew that, but she wrote that song. Eliana is a seventh grader in our in our church, a faithful member for uh, for lots and lots and lots of years. But that song uh, struck me as I was preparing as such a picture of of a psalmic quality uh, that all of us ought to have in our lives. Uh, uh, John Baldwin talked with her a little bit about the process that led up to her writing that psalm, which is really a psalm out of her life. Uh, and she shared that, that out of a, a, a time of, of struggle, um, God just sort of showed up in grace and mercy. She says, I don't really even know where the song came from. It was just a work of the Holy Spirit in my life. And, and, and I started writing the lyrics down, and, and suddenly I realized that the story I was writing down was my story. It was a story of God's faithfulness to me. Uh, it, uh, it brings together um, songs she learned when she was uh, very little in our church, but how the truths that she was learning have now become uh, real to her. And so uh, in a moment, I'm going to pray and uh, uh, 
uh, and then we'll conclude. And I'll just let you enjoy Eliana's song one more time. That'll let you do a little worshiping as we conclude. And then my question for you, even as she sings, is what songs have you written? What songs of encounter uh, can you share? Have you met the one true living God? And do you have a song to sing? Not a song uh, uh, written by somebody else. And I love the songs that are written by somebody else. But we ought to have stories of our own encounters with a God of grace and mercy, a God who pursues us, a God who disciplines us, the God who says to us through Jesus Christ, trust me and obey me because I want to use you for my glory. And if you've been brought to a place where you can say, even in the difficult times, even when things are hard, even when through our own foolishness we've gotten off course, that we're still a people who can say in faith, God, I need you. I don't understand what is going on, but I know that you're my answer. I need you, and I trust you. I trust you. The details belong to you, and I know you're going to reveal them at the right time, but I trust you. Let's let this be the, the call of our hearts as we encounter the living God together. Let me pray, and then we'll enjoy Eliana's song. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you're a God who meets us. I thank you that you're a God who met me. Even though my story included a time of rebellion and running from you, and it still includes plenty of moments where through my own uh, stubbornness, I find myself off the, off the course. But God, you are so good through your word, through your spirit, through your people uh, to bring me back to yourself. And so God, we pray, even in this unusual time that you have us together as a people, Lord, we pray that you would meet us our cry to you, God, is we need you. We need you. Forgive us for trying to have those needs met in other ways. Only you, God, can satisfy. We need you. We need you. And we trust you. There's a lot that we don't understand. Most things we can't figure out. But Lord, we're thankful that you're sovereign and you're in control and you're at work for our good, and we trust you. Help us to learn to grow in that spirit of surrender and that spirit of trust. Help us to have a song that we can sing to you of our satisfaction in you and of our complete trust in you. A childlike faith that says, I need you. I trust you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Jesus.